Buyer wins my auction but won't pay. So I make fake accounts to win all his auctions without paying. I make art as a hobby. Metal sculptures, to be precise. I only sell them when I need a bit of money for something. I had a holiday coming up, so I listed one here on TradeMe, an auction site, for $1 reserve. The auction lasted 10 days, and the piece got quite a bit of interest in that time, with lots of people adding it to their watch list and bidding on it. It ended up selling for a bit over 500 bucks. Perfect! I contacted the winner with my bank details and asked for their delivery address. No reply. I emailed them again. Nothing. I look into his profile a bit, and sure enough, he doesn't follow through on half the things he buys. A fair few grumpy feedbacks from other sellers. He's a complete time waster. Huh, I'm a bit annoyed. I've already had to pay a listing fee, advertising fees, and a $40 success fee. I'll eventually get this back, but it's still annoying. Being in the limbo on a deal kind of sucks. You expect the money and kind of don't at the same time. It got me raging. I Google his email, nothing. I check if he has any listings for sale, and he doesn't at the moment. Besides giving him bad feedback, there's really not much else I can do right now. I add him as a favorite seller. This way, the next time he lists something, I'll get emailed about it, but he never does. About a year later, after I'd forgotten about all of it, I got a bunch of emails from TradeMe telling me that the Time Waster has new listings. Seems Time Waster is packing up shop and moving to Australia. Seems everything has got to go, mate. Ironically, his listing states that everything must be picked up by the end of August as, I'm moving to Australia. No time wasters. He's got listings for a car, motorcycle, tools, a welder, some furniture, rims, and a bunch of other stuff. I give his feedback another quick look to see if he's changed his ways lately. He hasn't. Over the following week, I research what a good price would be for everything on the lists. I share all of his listings with my friends and get them to add his listings to their watch list so he thinks they're popular. I instruct them to go into a bidding war with me on each item up to a certain amount, but no further. I win all of his auctions using a bunch of false accounts. Lucky guy gets top dollar for everything. I reply to all the auction winning email confirmations from the various accounts, arranging different pickup times for the goods, agreeing to paying cash on pickup for everything. As the weeks go on, I cancel, reschedule, rain check, and delay every pickup. Bearing in mind, I'm pretending to be a different person for each item from different SIM cards. On the day I had arranged to pick up the car, it had been agreed to previously that he could continue to use his car up until two days before leaving for Australia, because I'm a nice guy like that. I text him that I'm on my way, see you at one. I was late, of course. Nearly there, mate, see you soon. Half an hour later, five minutes away. 20 minutes later, I'm here, where are ya? I ignore the text messages and waited for the call. The time waster calls me, where are ya? So I say, annoying, isn't it? What? Annoying, isn't it? What do you mean? You know, having someone bid on your auction with no intention of buying it. Are you freaking kidding me? No, I remember being quite annoyed when you did that to me. Who? When? I'll let you figure that one out. Bye. I hang up. Over the next few hours, I called him as the welder buyer. Annoying, isn't it? The motorbike buyer. Annoying, isn't it? Outdoor furniture buyer. Annoying, isn't it? All of them. To top it off, I gave him positive feedback on everything I bought, saying he was a top trader, A++. Easy pickup, good communication. In the coming weeks, I was contacted by TradeMe regarding his dispute. He was wanting to get the success fees back. Over 500 bucks altogether, I'd guess. So I responded to each of those with the fact that I'd already paid and picked it up and was happy with the item. Not sure if he got all those success fees back, but I very much doubt it. In short, someone won my auction and didn't pay, so I won all of their auctions and didn't pay either. Am I the jerk? Holy crud, you went scorched earth on this guy. Now, on the one hand, this guy was clearly a serial waster of other people's time with very little consideration for the many that he's inconvenienced. On the other hand, you went berserk on screwing up this guy's life in some pretty major and costly ways. Well, one hopes that he learned his lesson from the whole ordeal. Sounds like you probably could have done with the money on the auction that he shorted you for, so we maybe call it an eye for an eye and half of his face as well. $500 dues and success fees is no joke to anyone on an average income. 
I'll say that I hope he was eventually able to sort his affairs out after all this. Hopefully a relative in Kiwiland was able to at least hold the stuff for him until he relisted and managed to get some sort of non-joke customers. And hopefully by now, Trade Me, the service they use there, has updated their service with some more features to protect their various buyers and consumers. Because if the author were to try and pull this on eBay, you'd at least be looking at a string of investigations and going through some minor inconveniences for your trouble. It was probably a good thing that the list of people he'd wronged sounds like it was so massive, because this guy might have been motivated to drive over and give you a piece of his mind. He won't be able to figure it out, so let's call the author a jerk vigilante and move on. Are you even old enough to work here? This happened many years ago, nearly nine now. I used to work at a multi-million dollar sporting goods store. I'd been there for two years and was acting assistant manager, which makes it even funnier. This happened on a Saturday during one of our busiest sporting seasons. I'm assisting a customer and we don't have the item in store, but we can special order it for them. This process does take a few minutes, but I can use their coupons, unlike if they ordered it at home. So they agree. Of course, since it's busy, our internet is really taking a hit and it's going a little slower than usual. So we strike up a conversation. We're talking about their kids and how they're doing in school when the topic turns to me. For reference, the wife was standing with us, the husband and I, but she wasn't talking to us, she was focusing on her kids. The husband says, What year are you in school? Oh, I'm a sophomore. He looks shocked. Don't you have to be 18 to work here? I was confused as I was multitasking and hadn't picked up what they were putting down yet. Uh, yes? Well, how the hell are you working here then? Are they breaking labor laws? You're only 16 and they have you running around on a Saturday? You should be out, being a kid. I had a sudden realization at this. Oh yeah, I'm a sophomore in college. The customer is just staring at me, so I tried to break it down for them. I'm 21. Two, one. Born in the 90s. I've been working here for two years. They were so shocked, they just stayed silent for the rest of the transaction, which thankfully was only a few seconds longer. I sent them off with a cheery, Have a good day. Let us know if you need any more assistance. As they were walking away, and I heard the wife yelling at the husband for assuming my age and how disrespectful it was, with the husband trying to recover and spouting out, Well, you thought she was young too. Which, as I assume, did not go over well for him. Look, I don't like to go to bat for a big corporate chain, but why would that kind of brand of all places risk being caught out breaking labor laws? Feels like they have everything to lose from that. I do sympathize with the curse of the baby face, however. I've been in grown adult office jobs being subtly probed about whether I'm actually old enough to be there as well, and it never gets any less annoying. Like, my boss just told you that I'm one of the main database coordinators. Why do you assume that he plucked me out of middle school to do that? The office isn't that hard up on funds that they went from slight layoffs to child labor at the drop of a hat. To be honest, the narrator didn't know that any labor laws would prohibit an actual kid from working on a Saturday. I worked fast food and paper rounds during school in the mid-2000s, and as far as I know, that was all completely above board and legal. Is this an America thing, or is the parent just kind of ignorant? If you like Am I the Jerk, you're probably going to love Am I the Genius. Check it out, linked below. Also, go to amithejerk.com slash submit if you would like to submit your own stories. You were never my dad. Back in the mid-90s, my sister got knocked up by a guy. She was 17 and he was 18. I despised the guy with pretty much every fiber of my being. My mum decided, however, that a baby should know their father, so she invited him to come live in our house without telling me. It took me a week to calm down enough so that when I eventually came back, I didn't punch him when I walked in the door. John was a piece of crap. Great artistic talent, but all he did all day was sit out in the garage and do prison tats for people, in addition to stealing mine and my deceased father's power tools and pawning them for a few bucks so he could get some cigarettes. I worked a full-time job and went to school, so I'd be gone for 12 to 14 hours a day, but it felt like I was pulling into the driveway of a frat house, with a dozen or so people drinking and partying in the garage until I had to leave in the morning. I slowly curtailed that crap by being a giant pain in the butt to all the guests by having their cars towed or their wheels inexplicably slashed. By the time my nephew was two, I'd managed to put a stop to the 24-hour party zone, but people would still congregate on Saturdays. A few months later, I'd had enough and threw John to the curb. My sister's friends all came forward to tell her about how he'd hit on all of them, 
and probably slept with half of them, plus some other loose women he'd meet, all the while professing his devotion to my sister and their child. After I'd thrown him out, John disappeared for eight years, no idea where, and I didn't really care. Then came a court summons for a custody hearing. John was suing for custody? However, in the eight years since he'd disappeared, my sister had met a guy and they'd gotten married. My nephew was formally adopted by his stepdad and changed his legal name. The first hearing was dismissed because the allegations made as the basis for the custody hearing were investigated by CPS and decided as having no substance in fact. The nephew wasn't beaten, mistreated or neglected. The house wasn't a disaster or in danger of falling apart, nor was it a health threat. Every few months, John would file another custody hearing request until it finally got a date. John made a number of allegations, all of which were disproven by documentation and facts. Finally, the judge decided he'd had enough and called my 10-year-old nephew up and asked him who he wanted to live with. I don't know him. He walked out of my life when he was two. He's not my dad. My stepdad is my dad, and John will never be my dad, and I don't want to ever see him again. The judge ruled against John and dismissed his custody request with prejudice. When I looked at John, he was sobbing in his chair as his mother comforted him. I sneered at him and flipped him off as I walked out of the courtroom. As to why John was missing for eight years, apparently he had been committed to a mental facility in Tennessee, and when he got out years later, he went on SSI disability and then plotted various ways to hurt me, my sister, and my mum once he got out. He had called CPS on us, made a number of anonymous complaints about substances and weapons, and even called the fire department a time or two. The custody hearing was meant to be the culminating event, but fortunately John was an idiot and we'd had enough money to hire a good attorney. A few years later, John tried to mend some fences with my nephew and invited him to come down to where he lived and meet his relatives, including a half-brother my nephew didn't even know that he'd had but her mother deliberately excluded John from the birth certificate. This is in addition to the half-brother and sister he has from his mum and adoptive father. Needless to say, my nephew was not terribly impressed by his relatives. Now, my nephew and brother-in-law are some serious rednecks, and they both love weapons, hunting, camping out, and generally living the redneck lifestyle, but apparently John and his family took it to some serious extremes. There's a photo I saw one time on the internet with some guy sitting on a toilet on his front porch. And I imagine John and his extended family lived something like that. Only seriously and not done as an internet joke. Considering the area, I wouldn't be surprised. So anyway, when my nephew was 15, almost 16, we received a call that John was dead. Someone had put a shotty to the back of his head and blown his brains out as he sat on the couch in his mobile home. I felt sorry for John's girlfriend and her son who found him, but for John, I didn't feel a thing. A journalist tracked my nephew down a few months later and filled us in on some details. Apparently, John had been killed as a result of a murder-for-hire plot. We learned through our own sources that John had been dealing substances and unknowingly moved into someone else's territory. The would-be kingpin paid a guy a few hundred bucks and the promise of an ATV to kill John. Typical redneck retribution, I guess. The journalist asked my nephew for a quote. Sure. I wish I could meet the man who killed him. Why is that? The journalist asked. So I could shake his hand. John was never my dad and I won't miss him. Cripes. Well, those are some strong feelings there, and it doesn't sound like John was an awfully considerate spouse or parent. Honestly, there's a special kind of messed up that you have to be to try and take custody of a kid purely to upset the other parents. And it's clear that, aside from just being kind of a jerk... John was also pretty mentally unwell. The substance use didn't help. I couldn't help but chuckle at some of the extreme redneckness on display here, though. Taking a man's life, with all the horror that entails, in return for a couple of hundred and an ATV, sounds like something straight out of the darkest version of the show Letterkenny that a man can envision. If we rule out the unfortunate fact of his death, it seems like everyone on the author's side was left better off by John's absence. Also, your nephew is savage. I know a lot of kids with estranged family have very complicated feelings and can be prone to be too forgiving, no matter how much of a bad influence the missing parent was. So it either speaks volumes of how bad a job John did or how well his stepdad was doing. John aside, it's good that your sister was able to move on to a more wholesome family environment. Some people have types, but thank goodness that she was able to learn from the mistakes of her first choice and go for a completely different kind of guy on round two. 
Oh, you must know the owner so well. I work as a cashier at a locally owned and run grocery store. It's owned by a family that many people know and try to use to their advantage. The other day, I was checking out a woman who was buying quite a few flowers. She goes to tell me that she's a florist and blah 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 and asks if we have a florist on staff right now. She asks this right as the owner Blake was walking by. So I get his attention and ask if we have a florist on staff. And he tells her, no, we don't at the moment, and walks away to do whatever he was going to do. Hmm, y'all don't have a florist then. I say, no, we used to, but she retired a little while ago. Okay, that's cool. I should definitely submit my resume to Blake. We're old friends, you know. Is he here today? Um, yes, um, he's here today, actually. Never mind. I'll talk to him when I bring it in. Oh, well, I can give you an application if you'd like, ma'am. No, no, no. The resume is only a formality. I'm sure I'll get this job. Blake owes me a favor anyway. Him and his wife, Jen. And she leaves. I later asked Blake if he had any idea who that lady was, and he said no. So I told him the story, which he found very comical, especially the fact that his wife's name is Kate. I don't know who the frick Jen is, but he was right there. Really, lady? This isn't the first time that people have tried to get what they want by dropping names, even fake ones. So I've read a few different accounts of people trying to name drop or bluff their way into getting free stuff from stores and restaurants before, but this might be the first case of someone trying to fake it until they make it into an actual paying job this way. What was this woman's long-term plan when she actually met Blake? Try to gaslight him into thinking that they'd actually been friends for years? Go and photoshop and fabricate a long, vibrant history of travel and parties together? Perhaps a former relationship? Either this is one of the boldest applicants for a position that I've ever seen, or she was utterly pants-on-head insane. Maybe a bit of both. Was there a chance this might have worked if Blake hadn't in fact been standing right there in her field of view without her recognizing him? Because that's the only real actual proof the author had in this story. If Blake hadn't been there in the store, this lady might have at least got an interview on her gall alone. Sure thing, boss. I'll follow the GPS. I drive a concrete truck. We deliver ready-mix concrete throughout a fairly large area. Keep in mind, concrete has a shelf life of 90 minutes once water mixes with the cement. This is very important on spec jobs. Our company uses a routing and tracking system I will call the Terrible System. If there is a good route or less than good route, it chooses the worst route of all routes possible. After working with it a short time, this was noted. During training, new drivers are told to use it for the final part of the route only. The problem is, every time one doesn't follow the route, an alert is sent to management. Early into using Terrible System, the old managers found a way to turn off these alerts. Then a new manager starts. After a year, he brings up in meetings that drivers aren't following the terrible system's routing. Multiple times, we tell him it gives us the worst and longest routes, but he doesn't listen. After six months, he states that drivers will be written up if we continue to not follow terrible system's routing. Drivers don't listen to him. A few days after his announcement, a fellow driver is written up. This is talked about. Q malicious compliance. The next day on my second load, I have a load to a location that I've had before. It's 15 miles to the east of the plant, and then a 10 miles leg north. Following that route takes about 45 minutes or less. We had been going to this job site for three months by this time, and we knew Terrible System gave a much longer route. I was the first truck of four, and noted on the radio we needed to follow Terrible System route as directed. So off I go. The route it takes me on is southeast 13 miles. North on Interstate Highway, 35 miles, including a chicken coop, way station for non-truck drivers, trucks are chronically overweight for interstate, east through a large metro area for 20 miles, followed by last leg south of about 15 miles. Takes 125 minutes for me. The terrible system gave an estimated travel time of 140 minutes, so I actually did pretty well. I arrive and I'm timed out. The concrete is ruined. Rejected, and that cost the company a thousand bucks for the concrete, not to mention 20 gallons of fuel that I burned. Second and third truck are the same. Fourth truck was stopped at Chicken Coop, and company had a $500 fine. The customer is furious, calls manager screaming. The manager asks to talk to me, and I tell him we followed the terrible system routing as directed, and he can check that easily. 
The next day in the break room, a sign is posted stating that drivers are to use professional discretion in choosing the best and most expeditious routes for jobs. And there you go, a manager with no actual experience in the matter, dictating that his employees follow a system so that he can be seen having an influence on day-to-day affairs, before swiftly figuring out that there was a reason why everyone stuck to their old system in the first place. Decision costs the company thousands of dollars when people listen to it, so it's time to backpedal, backpedal, backpedal. Laying several thousand dollars in wasted money at these people's feet really is the only way to get through to some of them sometimes. Also, observe that he wasn't able to announce his latest policy change to the team's face, either in a meeting or through an email. He had to go on a sign posted overnight in the break room while no one was looking. It's hilarious. I think I have an actual good idea for him, though. One would think that maybe he was able to show some effectiveness to his higher-ups by slashing the cost of the terrible routing system from the budget and calling it a day. Everyone wins that way. When you subscribe, make sure to hit the bell to turn on notifications. Put the playlist on in the background to finish listening to all the stories. Or if you want to check out some great music, check out easymode.com. If you like Am I the Jerk, give Am I the Genius a shot. Everything linked in the description.